Lots of people look out at the horizon and see Lundy and wonder whether it's worth going there. Well, I want to show you that it is, and why. Lundy is 10 miles out into the Bristol Channel from Heartland Point, but to get there, we'll be travelling today from Biddeford. In the shadow of Biddeford Longbridge and under the watchful eye of Charles Kingsley is the Oldenburg. The Oldenburg is Lundy's supply ship, but it's on the Oldenburg that just about every visitor reaches Lundy. It's going to be a 23 mile journey and take about two hours. As we head off from the quay to pass under the new bridge, we're heading down the river Torridge towards the sea. The first half hour of the journey is a very pleasant river trip down the Torridge, which is one of the things that makes a departure from Biddeford particularly attractive. So after we've been going for a while, we pass close by the historic fishing village of Appledore. We're getting now towards the estuary where the Tor and Torridge rivers meet and here the Oldenburg will turn to follow the Boy shipping channel out towards the Biddyford Bar. After passing Appledore lifeboat we have on our starboard side the huge and famous sand dune complex of Braunton Burrows. And then not long after that, the Boyd Channel will take us over the famous Biddeford Bar and into the open sea proper. It may seem to take an age, but eventually we get close enough to the island to start picking out more and more details and the excitement grows. If we're lucky, we'll approach the island close to the north light and then cruise down the east side towards the jetty. We now get a sense of the height we have to climb to to get to the top of the island and some of the landmarks such as the church and the castle come into view. And here we are. Welcome to Lundy. Whilst the stores are being unloaded, most of the passengers, of course, will head straight up the long, steep road to the top of the island to start exploring the village. This is the landing bay, and some people may want to spend a bit of time here later. Next to where the Oldenburg is docked, there is an island called Rat Island, separated from the mainland of Lundy at high water. And those who enjoy rock pooling might like to go through the Gap Hell's Gate to the Devil's Kitchen, the rocky beach beyond, famous for its pools. Lundy is famed for its variety of marine life. But the beach here is very slippery and treacherous, so you do have to be careful. These are beadlet anemones, and here is a common blenny. Spider crab, Montague's crab, brown or edible crab. These are cushion starfish, and the little orange creature is actually a cowrie. Here's a dahlia anemone. And this one is a strawberry anemone who's managed to catch a jellyfish. And this pond is full of the searching tentacles of snake locks anemones, and here in its splendid green form. When we leave the beach, we follow the same road that the others took, beneath the south light. Beside the road are such special plants as the scarce wood vetch and the absolutely unique Lundy cabbage, the pale yellow blooms here. And then a bit further on, we turn the corner into the shadow of the trees of Milcombe. You may have noticed it from the ship as we came past. We 
can now pass through the gate at the entrance to Milcombe and up the stony path and then on up the steep stone steps and across the open field to come to the village itself and there ahead of us the building on the right is the Morisco Tavern. Or we could have turned left at the entrance to Milcombe and followed the more gentle vehicle track. That would give us an excellent view of the south light and some of the buildings we could stay at if we wanted to. But if we go on past the church we come into the village that way instead. This takes us into the very centre of the village with a cluster of granite buildings all around. Here are buildings available for rent, here's the campsite, here's the shop and here's the tavern with the island office next door to it. Many of the visitors, especially if they've come on a short day trip, won't get much further than the village. But if we look just a little beyond that, we'll realise that there's a farm surrounding the village too. Lundy has been farmed from ancient times. There's a good chance you'll see or hear geese in the field close to the tavern. And there are domesticated ponies in several nearby paddocks. And sometimes you may be lucky enough to see a beautiful little foal. A great favourite of the Gloucester Old Spot pigs, and piglets of course a wonderful bonus. <coughs> Lundy's rooftops and walls are often decorated by a big flock of starlings, part of the scenery. Look out for the sparrows too. There's a large flock of them permanently resident on Lundy and you'll notice that many of them have coloured rings on their legs because they have been the subject of a long period of scientific research. The island has a strong population of ravens these iconic birds are often found hanging around the farm and especially also anywhere along the east side. Once you've explored the village you'll probably find that the old light up there on the horizon has a magnetic pull. Like as not you'll encounter plenty of sheep on the way. As far back as 1274 Lundy was wrecked to have pasture for 900 sheep so sheep farming on Lundy certainly has a massive tradition. You'll find the view from the top of the old light pretty impressive, but the very height of the old light is one of its problems. It was the first of the lighthouses to be built on the island, but had to be abandoned because the light was constantly obscured by fog. There's a cluster of buildings there that are available for self-catering holidays. It's my very favourite place to stay. The little cemetery beneath the lighthouse is a place full of history with some extremely ancient gravestones. To the north of the lighthouse lies the large expanse of land known as Ackland Moor. As well as providing sheep pasture, this also doubles as Lundy's aerodrome. south of the old light there's still plenty to see. You certainly ought to have a look at the castle. This is another little place available for holiday lets and the castle itself in its rebuilt form has three separate areas of holiday accommodation. Below the castle is Benson's Cave 
which was used for criminal purposes by that notorious MP. From the extreme south end we look straight across 10 miles to the Heartland Point Lighthouse. This great pointed rock is Shutter Rock. Further around to the west is the huge blowhole called the Devil's Lime Kiln. And a little further up the west coast are the decayed Montague's Steps, named after the famous shipwreck, but they actually gave access to an earlier landing site. We now head northwards, taking the track from between the village buildings. No sooner have we passed through Quarter Wall than we run across the first of the island's free-running ponies. This wandering group are refreshing themselves at Quarter Wall Pond. This is one of Lundy's few freshwater habitats. It's a vital resource for all sizes of creatures. Close by is the ruins of the hospital building used by the Quarry Company in years gone by. We can expect the Highland cattle or the ponies to crop up anywhere now between Quarter Wall and Three Quarter Wall, where they are free to roam. They have important roles in creating different kinds of habitat for increasing the biodiversity of the island. The most important area of fresh water on Lundy is Ponsbury, seen on our left not long after passing Quarter Wall. Here we may see such characteristic plants as the bog asphodel or the spotted orchid. And if we're at the right time of year, dragonflies and damselflies flitting over the water. As we head on northwards up the track, we go through Halfway Wall, and on our right is Tibbets. Tibbets started life as an Admiralty signal station, but is now the remotest of Lundy's holiday properties. All around us now is moorland, with such typical vegetation as cotton grass. This is three-quarter wall. Beyond this, the land becomes increasingly arid and rocky. The bare granite bones of the island show through the vegetation. But finally, the North Light comes in sight. The North and South Lighthouses were built at the same time once it was realised that the Old Light was of no use. And we can go down long flights of steps to get down to the very tip of the island to North Ice itself. If we're lucky there may be numbers of shags on the rocks down below sorting themselves out after diving for fish. Back to the south again, springtime on Lundy. The feral soe sheep have their lambs too. This primitive breed is only half the size of the domestic sheep and can be pretty wild in its behaviour. 
but not these today. The kids of the feral goats are somewhat bigger, born earlier in the year. The feral seek a deer are looking their handsome best. Flowers are blooming in the short, salty grass by the cliff tops and in the fertile paddocks around the old light. For a long time the skylarks have been singing, but now they become more and more conspicuous. As the season progresses, their main aim in life is to feed their young. And here are the lambs, what more need be said? Even the ewe gets caught up in the excitement and remembers her childhood. In early spring it's well worth exploring Milcombe because spring starts very early there. And close around the manor house itself, cultivated flowers mingle with the wild flowers of the island. No doubt you'll be led on further and further onto the paths of the east side. Later in the year, bracken will cover the slopes, but now is the time for the native flowers to flourish. There are few trees on Lundy, so the woodland areas are particularly special. Later in the spring, the bluebells spring up, still managing to stay ahead of the growing bracken. As the season advances, other flowers take their turn in the succession. Increasing numbers of spring migrant birds, like this chiffchaff, come to feed or to breed. Some passing on to other areas and others producing young here. We now move round from Milcombe to explore the east side of the island, sheltered and totally different from the west. The Upper East Path gives some of Lundy's most iconic views. But we have a choice, we can follow the Upper East Path next to the fields or the Lower the lower is harder going through wilder terrain. People often ask where they can see the deer, but the fact is they can crop up anywhere. You may well see them in the fields close to the village, but they'll very often be keeping an eye on you as you walk along the lower east path. Often they'll be grazing out on Ackland Moor, and fairly obvious. The only thing you can be sure of with the deer is that like the goats and the soy sheep, they'll go wherever they want to go and crop up all over the place. So all we can do is keep our eyes open and enjoy them when we do see them. If you're staying on Lundy, you'll soon discover that the east side is the best place to be when strong westerly winds are blowing from the Atlantic. And many of the landmarks will soon become very familiar to you. 
These are Bellevue cottages and they seem to be particularly attractive to various of the animals on the island. Perhaps because they can always find shelter from the wind there one way or another. They provide a very good viewpoint for humans too. Up ahead is the timekeeper's hut, but before we get to that we must drop down to Quarry Pool. And if you bring a bit of bread with you, you can entertain yourself by feeding the golden orf there. The timekeeper's hut from the days when Lundy had an active quarry industry is one of the few places where you could get a little shelter or you could sit on the seat outside. The Upper East Path now drops down to join the Lower East Path for a while and together they form the Quarry Road. You'll see the granite quarry waste strewn down the slopes below. The quarries themselves form sheltered habitats. There are often small birds flitting around there. In some places, carnivorous sundews grow from the damp quarry floor. The warmth and shelter attracts a variety of insects too. These are migrant painted lady butterflies that have discovered Lundy. This little butterfly is the small copper. You'll notice dung beetles busy on many of the paths. There's a lot for them to do. Peregrines, or in this case a kestrel, are often watching from above. As the quarry road reaches its end, you have a choice of either going along the cliff tops or dropping down again below the crags. Again, the upper path is much easier going and it also gives you some very good views. And here we cross halfway wall and we'll pass close to Tibbets. On this route, keep your eyes open for the amazing rock formation known as the Knight Templar. The lower path peters out just above Gannett's Bay. Just before you get there, there's another famous rock formation, Slipper Rock. Lundy has many classic rock climbs, mostly on the west coast, but these climbers are on Gannett's rock. Back now to Brazen Ward, down on the shore just north of Three Quarter Wall. It consists of ancient dry stone fortifications. Close by is the cave known as Queen Mab's Grotto, and the rock formation called the Mouse Hole and Trap. The rocks down here are much favoured by noisy oyster catchers. You'll often hear their shrill calls before you actually see the birds. Often you'll find divers or snorkelers who have picked up the boy. But our main reason for coming down is that this is a favourite haulite for seals so we must be very quiet and inconspicuous in approaching. You're likely to see the seals either side of Brazen Wood and also on the rocks down below the fortifications. A good time to see them hauled out is about three or four hours after high water. And many of the seals will still be on the rocks after low water for three or four hours after the tide has started rising again. It's vital to the welfare of the seals that they should be allowed to sleep and rest and no disturbance should be allowed if at all possible. So we must try to avoid being seen and be very inconspicuous. These seals are bottling, sleeping or resting upright in the water. But seals do need to spend several hours resting on the rocks. 
and so they take every opportunity to haul out and to do so. And we can get a great deal of pleasure just from sitting quietly and watching their behaviour. Seals are inquisitive creatures and often like to watch us from the water, but on the land they feel very vulnerable and threatened. This young seal is happy just resting and relaxing, but this bloodied old bull is bound to need his sleep after plenty of fighting, no doubt. We can see how important the haul-out period is to the seals by the way in which they frequently try to stay out of the water as long as they possibly can until forced off by the tide. They are playful animals, but it's not always possible to be sure if they're just playing or fighting in seriousness. But on the land, things are generally more obvious. They can make their feelings felt towards one another by showing their teeth and by howling. Often this is a female telling a bull his attentions are not welcome. Even at their crowded haul-outs, seals like a bit of personal space if they can get it, and sometimes that might require you to smack a neighbour on the head to tell her to move over. And flipper waving is another way of telling other seals to get lost. Now let's just watch one rock as the tide is dropping and it begins to be revealed and see the social hierarchy and the interaction of seals as they all want to get up there and rest.
Now we must leave the seals and move to explore the contrasting west coast of London. The west coast has been pounded by gales into a rugged and dramatic landscape. On the east coast, the sea is a marine protected area, but the west coast is available for fishing activities. We can drop down from the old light to follow one of the paths close to the top of the cliffs. The battery, just short of quarter wall, should be on everyone's visit list. Although you would think it was built for a defensive purpose, it was actually a fog signal station. Cannons fired warning charges in time of fog whilst the north and south lights were being built. And above the gun emplacement are two cottages for the families of those keeping the station going. It's not just the historic interest of the site, but also the dramatic location that should draw you down there. As you leave the site, look out for the golden hair lichen, which is nationally very rare and is fully protected. As we cross Quarter Wall, we are leaving the farmlands behind us. You can expect to see more of the feral animals now, although, of course, they can appear anywhere. And it's thought that the goats have been on the island since the earliest human settlement. They wander at will, including the farmland, but tend to prefer the wild and rugged places. Continuing northwards from Quarter Wall, we come across an area of very fissured, and broken ground, a landslip which is known as the earthquake. The area around here is highly favoured by wheat ears during their breeding season. These little birds make themselves very conspicuous by choosing high points to perch on. The adults quickly dart away from us, but the young ones are more trusting. Rabbits were important on Lundy since at least the 12th century and numbers have risen very high at certain times. But in recent years they've been hit by wave after wave of disease and sadly you'll be lucky to see even one now. Ahead of us lies Jenny's Cove for now, we'll admire the scenery, but we will return to spend some time there. Take note of the impressive granite stacks known as the cheeses as we head towards Halfway Wall. This whole dramatic coast is a place to linger and soak up the scenery. Best to make the most of it on those days when there is no fog or gales. If we haven't encountered them already, we're very likely now to come across a soy sheep. From a distance they can easily be confused with goats, and they like just the same rugged areas. Soy sheep are the most primitive domesticated sheep in Europe, and this feral flock 
is about as close as you're likely to get to wild sheep. Like the goats, they seem to delight in taking unnecessary risks in order to get a bit of food. And they certainly seem pretty wild and a bit crazy at times. furthest we'll go today is to look at the Devil's Slide. This is a smooth slab of granite which is famous for its rock climbs. But we now go back to have a closer look at the coast below Three Quarter Wall. It's the seabirds breeding season and the point of interest is the stack below which is called St Mark's Stone. It's probably between April and June because the rock is packed with guillemots. Here and at wonderful Jenny's Cove, the crags, water and air are full of seabirds come to breed. Along with seals, this is probably Lundy's greatest draw. These birds on the water here, guillemots, razorbills and puffins, are all orcs. When not ashore in the breeding season, they spend the whole of their lives at sea. Let's look at some of the species that we might hope to see. We've seen the shags before, but now in breeding plumage, they have a striking crest on the top of their heads. These are the handsome, lesser black-backed gulls. And this greater black-backed gull with its chick is a very formidable predator. Unlike the solitary greater black-backed gull, the herring gulls with which we're all familiar nest communally. The smallest gull is the beautiful little kittiwake, unfortunately in sad decline, a red-listed species. Listen out for them as they call their name, which you can sometimes hear above the hubbub of the guillemots. Their colonies are not always easy to see, as they like steep cliffs with little ledges on which to construct their nests. but they are delightful little birds and well worth looking out for. Apart from Lundy's four species of gulls, there is another bird that looks very like a gull but isn't one. This is the Fulmar, a bird very closely related to the albatross. Like the albatross, they pair for life and always return to the same nest site after spending the whole year at sea. They are wonderful flyers and need to nest where they can launch immediately into the air. They seem to delight in the freedom of the air and like albatrosses they fly with minimum wing movement. They fly with stiff wings unlike gulls. It's fascinating to watch their pair bonding displays, which are usually very vocal. And part of the bonding is mutual grooming. The 
reformers are like the three orc species, which also spend all their lives at sea. Their legs are set very far back on their bodies, which makes them extremely clumsy on land. In a way, it's a pity that so many of the visitors to Lundy come only interested in seeing the puffins when there is such a wonderful variety of other seabird life to enjoy, whether or not you see the puffins. You have to just soak yourself in the sights and sounds. The orcs are generally intermingled, from a distance all appearing to be black and white birds. But the great majority of the birds you'll see are guillemots. They vastly outnumber all the other species. These are the ones jammed on their ledges and keeping up a wonderful cacophony of sound in their jostling, quarrelling colonies. There's little more atmospheric on Lundy than the sights and sounds and smells of a guillemot colony. Guillemots are actually rather brownish, but the smaller razor bill is pure black and white, very dapper. Razor bills are in much smaller numbers and form loose groups. They're easily overlooked, but are a handsome bird as they sit craning their snaky necks this way and that. You should look out for them, usually slightly above the level of the guillemots and often mingling with the puffins. Puffins are the big sale, of course, and the huge recent increase in numbers is a great success story, but they can be hard to see on Lundy. This isn't Skoma, and without good binoculars you may well be disappointed. You would do well to focus on the areas just above the rocks, where lots of trampling has revealed the bare earth, and to look for their white cheeks, which none of the other birds have that and their big orange feet of course. Once you get your eye in you should be okay. This fellow looks a bit mucky but presumably it's because he's been building or extending his nest burrow. Puffins only begin breeding after five or six years, so most of the Lundy puffins will be non-breeders as the numbers build up. They're a joy to watch, of course, seeming very relaxed with their chums as they just sit and watch the world go by, with occasional forays out to sea for a bit of fishing. Another very important Lundy bird you are highly unlikely to see, except perhaps from the Oldenburg when it's flying at sea. The Manx Shearwater also nests in burrows, 
but it's extremely clumsy and very vulnerable on land. So it will only come to its burrows in the steep slopes and under boulders on dark nights. If you're staying on the island, you may hear its wonderful eerie call. And if you do, you won't forget it. All of these seabirds are the prey of the peregrine falcons. Look out for them as they sit on their vantage points, or you may hear their wild screams. By the time autumn comes, most of the breeding seabird visitors will long since have left Lundy. This is the season of storms, Lundy is not always as tranquil as some of the photo images suggest. When a westerly gale is forecast, even large ships may anchor in the lee of the island and batten down the hatches. Or boats may steam backwards and forwards, trying to keep out of trouble. Life on a windswept island can be hard. This year the baler broke down halfway through the hay harvest and half the harvest ended up in the sea and a lot more on the fences and around the village. On days like this the landing bay may be relatively sheltered but Hell's Gate lives up to its name. Gale battered west coast is only fit for goats. But autumn is also harvest time, and now the island plays host to large numbers of birds needing to feed and rest during their migration. This is a delightful time in Milcom and on the east side, which can be full of life and song. Here's a dunnock. This is a female black cap. The twittering flocks of goldfinches are conspicuous and beautiful. Resident robins are joined by temporary visitors and they can seem to pop up everywhere. Always a delight. Here's a willow warbler. And this is a gold crest.
small wonder that the spring and autumn migrations draw scores of birders to the island, especially the bird ringers who do such a wonderful job in monitoring the various species. Once the birds have refuelled, they are eager to continue their migration. On walls and posts, more and more meadow pipits and wheat ears are restlessly gathering. Ruffled by adverse winds, they are waiting their opportunity to set off on the next leg of their long journey. As they look out to sea on the west, on the other side of the island, gathering flocks of swallows are lining the wires, also getting their strength up ready to go. But as their season comes to an end, down below, new life is coming into being. Autumn visitors to the island may come across wildlife as soon as they step off the boat. These inexperienced seal pups don't seem to be much bothered about all the noise and bustle going on around them. These are wieners. They are a few weeks old and have been abandoned now by their mothers, left to develop adult coats and to go to sea when they are ready. You may see other pups around, perhaps on Landing Bay Beach. Wieners are generally developing patterned coats, but the plump white-coated pups may still be being fed by their mothers. This newly born, pitifully crying little white coat will need weeks of feeding before it will be big enough to be left on its own. The mother will stay close by and return from the sea frequently to give regular feeds of her very rich milk so that the pup will rapidly put on weight. All they have to do is to snooze on the beach and get fatter and fatter. Until they are fully ready to go, the pups need to keep out of the water as much as possible. The sea is a dangerous place for them. At Hell's Gate, an over-adventurous pup leaves its exhausted mother and goes into the turbulent rising water. Such decisions cost lives, but high tides and gales cost many more. risks being swept out to sea and the mother sleeps on, oblivious of the danger. Another drama is being played out on Quarry Beach. The young white coat is struggling to get away from the rising sea over the great round boulders. Its mother, handicapped by being blind in at least one eye, strives to stay with it. There is a further danger besides the sea. A huge bull seal is eager to mate with her. She must keep him off and safeguard her vulnerable pup. 
moment the bull gives up, they are able to rest briefly. Our time on Lundy is almost at an end, so we'll finish our explorations with a picture of contentment. It is approaching the time for boarding the Oldenburg and from all over the island people funnel their way down towards the jetty. We've been away for a few days and the return journey is to Ilfracum. Even in two or three visits you won't have seen all the things you've seen in this film, but Lundy repays those who get to know her. And I hope that like me, you will leave with a store of sights and sounds which will enrich your life and that you will soon be back to experience more of the unique and enthralling world which is Lundy.